Now let me show you one more metadata product out of the Getty, the thesaurus of geographic names. And uh, I, I promise you I'm not in the employ of the Getty. Um, I don't mean to turn this into a, a love fest for the Getty, although I do have a great deal of respect for the work that they do. It's just that the Getty has a huge collection of art objects, and so they obviously have a vested interest in developing uh, controlled vocabularies to describe those objects. So, the thesaurus of geographic names. Remember that in the art and architecture thesaurus, one of the facets was styles and periods, right? So, in art and architecture, you have a set of terms that you can use to describe the period of time in which an art object was created. But what art and architecture doesn't give you is a set of terms to describe the place where an art object was created. And that's what TGN, the Thesaurus of Geographic Names, allows you to do. Now, this is the interface for TGN, and it looks pretty much exactly like the interface for Art and Architecture Thesaurus, which is hardly surprising since they're both Getty products. So again, let's browse the hierarchies, and let's actually go to the root of the TGN hierarchy. And what we see here is that there are two sub categories, world and extraterrestrial places. Now, I find that kind of hilarious because as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been a whole lot of art that's been created uh, not on the Earth, but um, I suppose the Getty is planning for uh, future developments. Um, so if we drill down into extraterrestrial places, we get the Milky Way galaxy and the solar system and the planets and we drill down into say Jupiter and we get a list of moons and other things. So we can at some future date describe an art object as having been created on you know Europa, who knows. Um, but let's actually back up a bit to the uh, top of the hierarchy and look at a perhaps more realistic example. Let's look at something that's actually in the world. So here we have the list of political entities that are subcategories of the world. Now notice that you have all kinds of things here. You have historical regions and former nations and states, right? We have continents. We have associations, etc. So we have both current and historical political boundaries. We have cities and nations and smaller divisions. And we also have physical features, mountains and rivers and whatnot. So for example, let's drill down to Antarctica, let's say. And now political boundaries in Antarctica don't work exactly the same way as they do in the rest of the world, but that's why this is kind of a nice example. What we have is the Antarctic equivalent of political boundaries, right? Territories and colonies, etc., overseas territories and whatnot. These are political entities, but if we click on view physical features, we get a whole different set of subdivisions under Antarctica. We get physical features. We get capes, islands, mountains, highlands, seas, etc. The physical features that are subcategories of Antarctica. Let's uh, go back up and look at, let's say, the continent of Africa. And again, we get a list here of political entities, but we could, if we so chose, look at the physical features of the continent of Africa instead. So let's scroll down to, let's say, Morocco. 
and again list of political subdivisions we could look at the physical features if we wanted and there's a list of provinces and prefectures let's look at Casablanca so Casablanca inhabited place that is the entry for the city of Casablanca and what we get is the ID number for this particular entity in the hierarchy, the name Casablanca, GPS coordinates to pinpoint on a map where Casablanca is in the world. We have a scope note and a list of names, including preferred. We have a list of alternative names the Getty recognizes that Casablanca has been called other things in the past, it's called other things in other languages, but if you're using the thesaurus of geographic names, then the preferred name to use is Casablanca. You should use that term rather than any of those other terms. And you get the position of Casablanca in the hierarchy. It is under world, Africa, Morocco, etc. Here's the question that all of this has been leading up to. We've looked at the art and architecture thesaurus. We've looked at the thesaurus of graphical materials. Now we are looking at the thesaurus of geographic names. We've looked at two controlled vocabularies, two thesauri to describe art objects and one to describe places. If you need to describe art objects, what is the best metadata schema to use? And I'll tell you what I tell my students in the classroom, and that is, it depends. That is a very unsatisfying answer. I realize that, but it is an honest answer because here's the thing. What kind of art objects are you trying to describe? Who are your users? What are the things that those users may want to do with the art objects or with the metadata records, right? All of these questions are going to dictate which thesaurus you're going to want to use. Are you describing graphical materials, images, photographs, and the like? Well, then you might want to use the thesaurus of graphic materials. Are you describing furniture? Well, then TGM might not be appropriate. Art and architecture might be more appropriate. Do you have a need to describe geographic locations related to those art objects? Well, then thesaurus of geographic names might be relevant. And of course, there are alternatives to all of these. There are other metadata schemas out there that fulfill similar functions. So all of these questions of who are you creating metadata for? Right? What are the particular requirements for description, et cetera, et cetera, will help you decide what the most appropriate metadata schema is. There are no hard and fast rules here, unfortunately, much as we might like there to be.